And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is a fellow podcast host, and he is with the show Indie E Radio with Lee Whitting, obviously named after himself, Lee. What you guys may not know is that Lee is also an experiencer from having an NDE after drowning, which we're going to learn about and more. Lee, it is a pleasure to have you on the show and to finally meet you. Thank you for joining me and welcome. Well, thank you. It's wonderful to be on your show. I've, uh, I, we'll have to turn the tables on you and have you on our show as well at some point in time. Well, there you go. Uh, my... My NDE uh, happened when I was uh, about seven and a half years old. And it happened because uh, my father had built a little cabin on a little island on a little lake in New Jersey. And uh, we used to hang out there all the time, weekends. We'd go, we'd go there. Now, I had uh, never learned to swim. Seven years old, I would tell everyone out there, teach your child how to swim unless you want to risk uh, they're having an more than an NDE. Yeah. <laughs> it's so easy to drown and so many children are lost that way. But I want, I waded out too far. My mother had just gone back into the cottage to change. I think she was getting ready to go to church as a matter of fact. And uh, the, the uh, edge of the lake went down like this and then it went like that. And when I stepped off, I, I was uh, lost. There was no way I could get back. It was just mud underneath. It was very slippery. And I realized that I was um, going to sink. And I screamed. When I uh, screamed, I let all the air out of my lungs. And I sank. Fortunately, my mother heard me scream. And she came running out and running down the steps of the cottage in her red dress, and I know all this because while my body was down at the bottom of the lake, um, my soul, my consciousness was perched in a birch tree right by the cabin cottage door. So I saw her. I saw her running down. She realized what had happened. She knew where I'd been moments before because she'd just gone into the cottage. And she dove into the lake and went down, found me, and pulled me out. Um, the two things I, I, I have to say about this, um, one, um, I was, uh, feeling a little depressed <laughs> at the time because I had had all my mother's love and attention when I was the oldest child. But since my father had come back from the war, this, this happened in, uh, 1950, I guess, um, she'd had two more children and I was feeling kind of neglected and I was wondering if my mother still loved me. So when I was out of my body, I realized intensely how much she loved me and God loved me. It was the simultaneous mix of, of a powerful source of love. I didn't see any angels. I had no beings to tell me what to, what had happened or where to go or what to do. But I, I felt overwhelmed with a sudden realization that all of my feeling sorry for myself had, had been a wasted time. Um, and I watched her throw my body down over a log. And she was pushing on my back, trying to get the water out of my lungs, which, as she described it later. The process... Uh, of having that log under me and her pushing on me was like uh, she invented upside down CPR. CPR was not something that anyone generally knew back then, but her compressions got my heart started again. And I knew I had a choice. More had happened than I could remember, but my primary attention was focused on this amount of love that I was feeling both from the source and from my mother. And so then I was back in my body. Um, I never had to go to the hospital or anything. She put me, put me to bed and, uh, and I decided then 
knowing my mother and knowing what I knew about my mother, having been out of my body and what is it you do? Read, read someone's mind, read someone's emotions. I knew it would be terribly upsetting to her if I told her that I had actually gone through that process, that I'd actually died and that I was watching her do what she did. So I never told her and I never told anyone for decades uh, until I finally got, um, like many people will say, until they encountered Raymond Moody's book and Life After Life and and uh, began to realize that this was not a singular event, that it happens to people all the time, more and more often. Um, I had this recurring dream that accompanied this whole uh, episode. It was that I was, I inter interpreted it to, to mean that I was sinking down in the lake, that it was a dark space all around, that there was a singular point of light at the top of the water that I was looking up at, and I was falling down, falling away from it. And uh, when I was in my 20s, I thought, I should go back and see if that's actually uh, what happened, because this was... Uh, this the, I had this dream constantly for a long time. So in my 20s, early 20s, I dove into the lake on a similar weather, similar day, um, dove down, looked up, and there was light all around. The light was all covered the surface of the lake. The light was down in the water as far as I, down as I had sunk. It was all just uh, uh, very, it was very different. And, the, and then it was after that, when I encountered these stories about tunnel and light and falling back into your body and that sort of thing, that I thought, well, perhaps that's what had happened, that perhaps I had actually gone further than I could remember experiencing, but that that was the, uh, that was the reason that I had interpreted these dreams the way I had. Uh, then, uh, Something else that occurred that uh, probably my mother must have noticed, well, she changed too. Uh, I think she became much more involved in religion. Thankfulness to God that I hadn't drowned, I suppose, something like that. But I also, being a kid, what <laughs> my dad was in television. He had, he'd come back from the war. He'd gotten a job at Dumont Television, which was a network in New York. And I was in, kind of intrigued by these TV shows like uh, Captain Video and Kukla Fran and Ollie and Howdy Doody. You've probably heard of them. You've probably never seen any of these. They were really st stupid little shows on television. I, l I lost interest in that. And I found myself being out in uh, at night, just sort of looking at the sky. I got my mother to buy me a... Uh, reflecting telescope and I spent any clear night I was outside looking at the moon looking at the Pleiades looking at the Mar the uh, looking for the moons of Jupiter that sort of thing and uh, and then I carried it one step further and wound up building like a planetarium in our attic where I would write shows and I had this little projector that we got from the Hayden planetarium gift shop and I would drag my mother upstairs and have her lie down on a mattress on the floor. And we'd, I'd project this show and tell her all about the creation of the world, the end of the world, um, what would happen if a, if a large asteroid or meteor hit the Earth. And, uh, and so it really changed my whole outlook on life. I, I was, it made me very curious uh, to know more about the big picture of things. And so... Uh, I'm sure even if she hadn't suspected that I'd had something out of body, that uh, that she saw a big change in my personality. Lee, thank you for sharing your experiences with us. You immediately went to a birch tree when you had your experience. Is there any significance with that tree? Well, I was not, I didn't feel like I was standing in it. I was floating in in the branches of it. And it was a tree that I really loved. And uh, unfortunately, the climate has changed so such in New Jersey that there are no more birches on uh, anywhere around that uh, island or lake. But um, 
But uh, there are in Maine, and I think one of the things that I loved about Maine when I finally moved up here was the fact that there were birch trees. So I guess I identify with them in some way. After you felt this intense love from your mother and God, I know you were only seven, but how did you change? Well, it just, it left me feeling, uh, it opened my eyes, basically. I, I felt much more curious about why things were the way they were. You know, when you're when you're seven years old, you don't generally remember much about where you came from. And I don't remember ever having that ability, but I know lots and lots of kids have. And I've interviewed people who've told these amazing stories about memories of past lives and so forth. But um, the uh, yeah, I think there's a a transition time where you just you you now you're in school and you're kind of locked into your um uh the 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 understanding of life that you're presented with through your teachers through your parents through your behavior patterns well you you've done a children's show right you mm -hmm. must have covered a lot of this territory in in your uh, broadcasts um and this changed my perspective. For example, I was being raised Catholic. I was in the Sunday school class where I was always diligent about memorizing my catechism lesson for the, for the weekend because we had this ominous nun who would stand over you and whack you with a ruler if you didn't. Well, I got, I got very indifferent to that whole process. Um, and I got whacked, much to the amusement of the other kids in the class, uh, because the you know the questions were interesting. Which was, mm -hmm. why did God make me? And the answer, as I recall it, was God made me to show His goodness and to make me happy with Him in heaven. Well, the question was profound, I thought, and the answer was really shallow. And so I just lost interest in putting these all of these questions and answers into my memory banks. And uh, and so I got scolded all constantly for not having studied my catechism and memorized the answers. And um, and that's, I just threw that out as an example of how my thinking was changing about, about things. My interest, my lack of interest in uh, Hopalong Cassidy on the, on the, uh, black, our little black and white TV and my, profound interest in astronomy. I mean, my father went out and bought me a college text on astronomy, which I struggled to read. I mean, I was seven going on eight. It was way beyond my ability to understand, but they understood how interested I was in the subject. And I really worked at trying to follow the, you know, the, the theories and the math and all of the stuff that went behind, you know, in-depth astronomy. I didn't really get it until much later at Columbia University, my science course, my first science course was astronomy mm. so that I could figure out what it was I'd tried to understand when I was seven. Have you ever thought about why you had such a strong interest in astronomy? Like, is it possible you had a previous life on another planet or something? Oh, I definitely think I had previous lives. I haven't had any memories of anything as profound as that my the, well, the only indication that i have had in my um in this life that i had a past life was that i had a, a another recurring dream which was i was a medic on a battlefield i'd just gotten out of the ambulance vehicle and it could have been a world war one or a world war ii vehicle i mean it was it was that kind of boxy nondescript vehicle with a big red cross on the side and i got blown up now now you don't normally draw, dream about dying but i knew it was it was me it, and it was obviously i was way too young to have <laughs> to have actually um understood that you know much about the war uh but uh i i knew when i dreamed that dream how how real it seemed to me hmm. so but um, I think what I have thought about recently was that maybe I had a, 
a, a residual memory of traveling through space because so many of the people who have gone through this, the, the tunnel toward the light uh, talk about space. I mean, uh, I think Carl Jung had a memory of going out into space and seeing the earth from a distance and, and um, along with many other people have had that experience. And so perhaps that's why uh, coming back from it, even though I didn't really remember that trip, I, I retained the curiosity of what was out there. Have you ever considered getting hypnosis to remember more of your NDE? Yeah, I have. I haven't done it. I perhaps I uh, oh, I still could. I'll have to have to take that into uh, consideration. I think what's fascinating is how the NDE not only affected your life but your mother's, because you said that she became more religious. Very much so. Uh, yes, uh, and she never talked about that incident to me. She never asked me about it, which was why I probably on that account never did finally fill her in on the out-of-body experience. But um, uh, she, she was just hard to explain, but I just understood at that moment. Well, well, let me go back for a second. When, when I was born, it was just my mom and me. My dad was away at the war. There were no other kids. Family, there was no family living close by. We spent 24 hours a day with each other in a small apartment in Yonkers, New York. And she had always had some mystical experiences. She told me uh, one day that she'd thought um, her late um, grandmother had come to visit and congratulate her on my birth. She saw her in the floating in the air above, uh, I don't know, something in the kitchen that I did not see, but she saw and she told me about that. So, but we, uh, we, we shared all the anxiety that she felt uh, concerning, you know, my father surviving the war. It was a heightened time emotionally. And so it was, for me, it was like being, never leaving heaven. I mean, she was such a, a devoted mother that it was like angels could have been in attendance. And I, of course, all that slipped away when my father came home and he was quite military at that point. And he expected discipline and, and uh, then she had more kids and her, her attention was split between my father and me and, and my two sisters. And so that, uh, that, that's why I, I say I, I might have been uh, depressed going into that drowning, but I came out of it absolutely assured of her love for me. And it was it was just more intense, I think, than probably any uh, relationship lacking some of those um, those uh, statistics, like you know how how anxious you can be during a war. I mean, this is this goes on in other families all the time, but for a for a young child not understanding the source of that attention and affection, um, it seemed like a real loss when everything changed. I know you are only seven, but if not early after your experience, more throughout your lifetime, were you already thinking about things like, "I'm never going to die. I'm eternal." because I've been out of my body and seen it there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. After, uh, after that experience, uh, lots of things happened. I mean, after the astronomy and so forth, I felt um, very independent, um, very self-assured. I mean, right after uh, college, I took a job. My father wanted me to go on, become a businessman, study for my um, MBA at Columbia. I got admitted, took one semester and said, I can't do this. Uh, quit that and became a caseworker in Harlem for the city of New York. Uh, when I, uh, when my wife and I had earned enough money, we bought a uh, Volkswagen camper from in Europe, took a coal freighter over to Germany, picked it up and lived in with, with our three-year-old son at that point for uh, almost a year, traveled all over Europe and the Middle East. Our parents were 
politely freaking out. They didn't think we should take a three-year-old at, you know, further than Poughkeepsie, rather, you know, let alone uh, uh, into um, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Israel, Turkey, all these countries that we went to. And we just, I always assumed that everything was going to be okay. I had this this feeling of assurance that we didn't even go to camps. We'd park by the side of the road. Remember one night we were parked just beneath the Acropolis and a whole bunch of kids came th uh, throwing stones at our camper and I got out and said, what's going on? And then they said, Germans? I said, no, we're American. Oh, that's okay. And they walked away. But uh, I never had any uh, fear of anything like that being a, a hazard or danger to me or to my family. And uh, I felt that way most of my life. I think that was probably a product of my NDE. Has the memories of your experience faded over time? Well, not really, but I, I do have a suspicion that, um, and I, I gather this from other people too, that when people tell their story over and over and over again, um, people that say go on tour, oh, Evan Alexander, for example, and it becomes a major, the major theme in their life. Now, NDEs are a major theme in my life, but it's other people's NDEs usually that that I'm thinking about, not my own. But I think you, um, the more you talk about uh, the story, the less you remember it clearly. In other words, I think the brain wants to rewrite stuff that the soul of originally communicated. That's something that's interesting to me too. How does if your soul leaves your body, your brain's still in your body, you go off and have this an amazing experience and you come back and it's your brain that's telling the world what, what was seen, but your brain wasn't out there. So how does that communication between soul and brain take place? That's a great question. Yeah. And so I think as, as the brain gets more and more possession of the event, it probably or could possibly become less and less true. I mean, if in you other want, words, true in us in the soul's way of seeing it. If you want to talk about the brain, how were you even able to think without it sitting in that birch tree? Well, I think the soul has its own consciousness. I think that that's that's probably our primary source of consciousness, and the brain is just a, a mechanism for basically for protecting us for, I mean, where we live in the physical world, three-dimensional linear time, the brain is there to help us cope with what this reality is, to keep us from being eaten by the saber-toothed tiger. The brain is responsible for generating lots of fear that uh, is a protective device. Um, the soul is fearless. It's got nothing to be afraid of, um, and so it's uh, it's the the two are fundamentally at odd, and yet they work together. They have to work together because because that's who I am. That's who you are, and so how those how that integration works is is an ongoing puzzlement to me. I love the way that you put that about fear and survival. I mean, maybe our brain is independently feeding these extra thoughts of fear, worry, and anxiety just for survival. You know what I mean? Like we talk a lot about having a monkey mind. Yes. Because it, it's no longer got to worry about the things that the body worries about. Yeah. The, the thing, the thing that, um, and yet that's, that's where we want to be. That's where our hearts are. The difference, I guess, is that the soul knows that we're that we are fundamentally uh, love-based beings. That we, that God intended us to be. Uh, our our material existence should reflect the love that God, that the Spirit, and the and God, would like to see infuse the world, and yet, uh, it doesn't because of the of the dangers and the threats and the and the, our egos and our capacity to make war with each other all the things that uh, that drive um possessiveness and greed and 
guilt and anger and uh th these are all brain oriented brain generated uh events that the soul knows better than to get involved in have you experimented with trying to tell the difference between brain thoughts and soul thoughts well i i think what happens is when you've had a near death experience or an out of body experience or a spiritually transformative experience all the all the tags that we put on these things you know it you know what the difference is and that's why so many people come back and say they're no longer afraid of dying because that's the primal fear the body knows the brain knows that the body is going to die and when the body dies the brain's going to die and so it's really looking out for itself in a lot of ways and uh but the soul the soul is eternal and knows it's eternal and when you've experienced that sense of eternalness then that's what takes away the fear of dying after your experience, did you notice that you had any new abilities that you didn't have prior that could be considered psychic? Uh, not really. A lot of people I know talk about that and and uh, and how they interact with the physical world gets bothered too. You know, the people suddenly their wristwatches don't work, or they, you know, they have trouble with electronics or. Um, but I I never had any of that. I just felt, uh, I mean, I've stayed healthy. I haven't had any real health problems. And, and I've stayed pretty confident. And I've stayed pretty calm. I probably wouldn't have been nearly so calm if I hadn't had that experience. Because um, if you looked at my father's attitude toward life, which was coming out of the depression and the war was PTSD, you know, in a lot of different ways. And his father, who had been a migrant from Germany and had uh, struggled through, uh, had to struggle through the depression. And uh, I mean, there was all the potential for, for carrying a hugely uh, scary life pattern along, <laughs> along with that kind of heritage. But I, uh, after this, uh, after this event happened, I never felt any of that again. I mean, I can't, I shouldn't say I never felt it, but, but it, it, it didn't dominate my personality in any way. Do you think that your planetarium show was a prelude to what you're doing now? I think, yes. I think that the astronomy came out of my wanting to see the bigger picture. My planetarium came out of wanting to um have a hand or a voice in the bigger picture and my ultimate um occupation as a hospital chaplain utilizing near death experiences um to to take from one patient who loved talking about what they just been through to the next patient who needed reassurance because they were scared to death of dying uh and my uh, the whole theme of my doctoral thesis at the seminary was how can chaplains and medical people, hospice nurses and the like, utilize near-death experience stories to comfort people who are afraid of dying? So I would say yes. I think the 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 wanting to first looking at the sky and then wanting to control that bigger picture by writing the script around it was probably the beginnings of of a career that never materials materialized till uh, decades later did you encounter many people at the hospital who had ndes yes uh, but i sought them out too um when someone had coded and then was resuscitated which happens pretty easily in in a hospital setting because the the crash cart is right there everyone's you know monitored and they're on alert for something like that uh, so when I, when someone had just had that experience, I would go in, I'd say, well, did you see anything when you were on the other side? Tell me about it. And they were so, yeah, a lot of people said no, probably, uh, one in a dozen had a story to tell. And they were always so appreciative, even the ones that didn't remember anything, um, that 
that the chaplain was interested in that event or even that non-event. And sometimes they would ask me, now, why, why didn't I have an out-of-body experience? And that, that actually that happened later on when a lot of people had already read about NDEs and knew more about it at that point. And my conclusion finally was, and I think this makes sense, uh, the soul never, the soul made the decision not to leave the body. So if you've only got one in a dozen people that recognize, uh, you know, they were out of their body and they, they were watching the doctors try to get their heart started again, or they were up by the ceiling and, and watching, you know, listening to the conversation and all of the things that we hear as people relate their stories. Um, they their soul just stayed where it was and in fact uh it's just the other day i interviewed someone who was ta talking about how um how a soul can uh doesn't necessarily have to leave once the body has died the soul could stay there for 45 minutes an hour and i was aware of that uh even as a chaplain i would go in after after the family had left and unzip the the bag and uh, and talk to the person and say if you're still if if you're still here uh just look for the light there are there are angels there are spirits there's family members deceased family members that are there to help you don't get lost just go just go with them and um so i knew that possibility was there and it was only later on I thought, well, you know, if because there is, it's a pretty big disparity. If you're only getting one in a dozen that that remembers anything, well, one, it could be the brain doesn't want to acknowledge the fact that it happened, but two, uh, it could just be that the soul wasn't ready to leave the body, and so it wouldn't have an out of body. Uh, clearly, wouldn't have an out of body memory of things. You think it's possible that the soul knew that the body was going to make it? Oh, I think so. Sure. And just, uh, just decided to lay low and l let it happen. If we fast forward in your life, how did you get involved with ions? Well, uh, I wanted to do uh, once I was uh, working in the hospital, and I was getting more and more interested not only in in NDEs generally, but in the each case. You know, as as I wandered around, I'd collect all these stories from, from the patients who'd had an experience. And I want, and finally decided what I'm doing here is not being done uh, nearly enough. I mean, an awful lot of doctors and nurses absolutely refuse to acknowledge the, even the reality of a near-death experience. But I, I was thinking chaplains at least could be, um, and I got to be known as the NDE chaplain in the hospital because of whenever anyone started talking about it, they'd say, you you got to go talk to Lee Whitting or Lee Whitting has to come into your room and talk to you. So I I had all these stories collected and I was going to do my doctoral thesis on um, near the near-death experiences that I'd heard about in the hospital. And I went to the hospital and they said, there's no way you can do that because you don't have, you know, you'd, you'd have to get releases from all of these patients. And uh, it, it became an impossible thing because of patient privacy, the thing that they never really give you. They always threaten, you know, <laughs> yeah, HEPA. Is it HEPA that they, you're supposed to sign releases? HIPAA? HIPAA, that's right. Anyway, so, uh, so I went to IONS to get the stories because they have such a collection. I mean, the, from the 1970s on, they've, they've got an enormous... A, a resource there, which is um, thousands of stories of near-death experience and spiritual, spiritually transformative experiences. And so I drew on their files um, to do my uh, doctoral thesis. And um, and as I was there, I got to know them. Uh, Diane Corcoran was the president. She said, we need an editor for Vital Signs. You're a writer. <laughs> She, she didn't really know me from Adam, but I, this was the first time I'd met her. So I said, sure, I'll do that. So I volunteered to do that. And then I, uh, they put me on the board. And so I worked with the, with the board for a while. And it was there, actually, that I said, um, 
You know, what we really ought to be doing is some sort of a, an internet show. And uh, they said, well, go ahead and start it. So then that's when NDE Radio got started. And I credited Ions in all those early shows. I talked about Ions a lot and said, I'm brought to you by Ions and that kind of thing, because I wanted them to benefit from the show. But um, but it, it, it evolved, and I was willing to go further. I think I still am in my understanding uh, and appreciation for the reality of these stories as opposed to uh, people who still feel like they have to prove scientifically somehow that this is a real event. And it's a very hard, difficult thing to prove miracles, <laughs> what we would normally call miracles, are a real event because uh, they're not replicable at will in the laboratory. You can't just sudden, you know, the soul out of the body, at least not yet. So, but that, and we are looking at almost a thousand NDEs a day, just in this country alone. You can't deny the reality of these experiences. Veridical evidence that that is demonstrated, people who, you know, see and hear things that they couldn't possibly hear while they're lying dead on the operating table. Um, it's, uh, I mean, the, the evidence is overwhelming. But it's been a combination of two things. Um, science and religion, both, both of those uh, groups say they're looking for the truth. They want to see the truth. Show me the truth. And, I, and I'm always saying, well, if they really want to see and know the truth, they should be merging on the, in the reality of um, near-death experience because it, the, it, it, it's like it comes up and slaps you in the face how, how important, how true these events are. And the, and the fact that even the, how personalized these events are, they still come down to the, the conclusion that we are, are love-based uh, creatures. And I use creatures in a spiritual way. And that that is really, if we could get back to our, our reality of things, we could have our Eden back right here on Earth if we'd, if we'd let it happen. But we, uh, our egos screw things up. That's almost a great segue for me to say, well, how did our egos screw that up? Was there somebody intervening with that? Or is it all just about well, our egos? <laughs> that gets me into some of the other topics I talk about on the show is E.T. involvement. You know what I mean? Well, E.T. or, I mean, how are we supposed to understand evil? I mean, uh, there is so much... Um, what the Middle Ages blamed uh, on fallen angels, false gods, the Greek and Roman uh, religions that were based on um, morally flawed spiritual deities, which to me represents the, the fallen angel story and, and Lucifer and all of that. Uh, so there's some source of... Um, I mean that that was that story and other stories of demons and the like, ghosts that get stuck between worlds. Uh, I think there there is a reality there, but how to understand it? I mean, you could put it in alien in terms of aliens. I mean, there there are all sorts of stories that people have uh, reported being, you know, abducted and flying saucers and and operated on and you know sexually explored and perhaps even implanted with uh, with fetuses and you know all, all of these things which we would think you know just on off the top of your head would not not be a good thing it would be a bad thing uh, so there is some, we've got to deal with um, an understanding that things are that this is not eaten anymore that something has gone terribly wrong. I mean, just the fact that we're poisoning the, our environment uh, out of out of corporate greed is is you know one good example. Talk about sh short sightedness. Mm -hmm. You've done many podcasts with indie ears, probably at least five hundred. Have any of those guests told you that they saw ETs on the other side? 
uh, yes, some some uh, there's one woman comes right to mind who felt like she'd grown up with an ET as a guide. You know, sometimes people kids will say, "Oh, I I had a um, an angel, or I had a a, a, a a secret friend, or an invisible friend." But uh, she was quite sure this was uh, an alien, and um, and I think as we uh, now that the government is being a little more honest about what they've discovered in terms of UFOs and the like, I think we'll we'll hear more and more reports. It's sort of like uh, it, it, it's been such a fringe element. It's been worse than NDEs. You know, people talk about being abducted by aliens and. And I mean, NDEs are are easy to understand compared to that. But as these um, events come more and more into the uh, consciousness of the society at large, it won't be such a joke anymore. There were there have been times, you know, the X Files, for instance. That was a show that really popularized the notion. Yeah, the most popular planet that I've had guests tell me about that they go to is the water planet. Have you heard of that one? Well, I've heard of, of, um, is it in the solar system? I don't, there, I doubt it. I mean, I don't, there are I, some moons that are, that I think have water on them, but it's usually frozen. I mean, it's not, it's not a friendly water friendly place to be, at least not in terms of a liquid. It's, it's solid, but, um, beneath the ice, it was it's one of the one of the moons of one of the planets. I can't remember which one. Uh, you could have life. You could hold have a whole different. And you know, once once that life finds its own spiritual basis, it doesn't matter really what their body is like. It could be traveling at will in spirit form anywhere in the universe. I mean we. That happens to people who just having NDEs. So, if if that mode of travel were perfected, you can go instantly. I mean, you don't even need a wormhole. You just you can be somewhere else. Here's a common experience that intrigues me, and I wonder if these come across your show. A person ends up in a waiting room. A physical room, like a waiting room, sometimes there's someone there kind of like in charge of the waiting room. But, you know, they're not going to some magical place or some beautiful forest. They're in this structured room. Have you come across those? Well, as a chiropractor, you probably have. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, being, I'm being silly. <laughs> yes, uh, the waiting room could be... Um, it could be a purgatory setting. I think that some of the people, ghosts, for instance, you've probably encountered people or heard stories. There's a George Ritchie who told about people that, he, I don't know whether he was the, the source I'm thinking of, but there are people in New York, for instance, there's a class being taught by a former, um, a former member of the IONS board of how to leave your body and be um, a chaplain to or a missionary to ghosts that are stuck in between. And uh, I, I've interviewed a priest that does the same thing, but he doesn't leave his body. He just advises spirits on how to move on. But these guys will go, they'll say, well, they'll go into a bar and they'll see people who are addicted to alcohol standing next to a living person and as the person lifts their glass to drink from it, the ghost will be imitating that motion just to try and recapture the pleasure of that addiction when they were alive. People get addicted to alcohol, to drugs, to places, to people that they may have loved or hated, and it sticks them in a waiting room of one form or another. and. And they need to move on. Now you can't you can't force them to move on because it may some of this may be a regret or a feeling that they failed to do something they were meant to do in their life. 
And so they're trying to figure out a way of how they might accomplish it from this intermediate intermediary position of being a ghost. Um, but for the most part, they're just lost. They're just lost. And, um, and, the, and it will take different forms. I'll tell you a story about the worst death I ever attended as a chaplain. This family was just at each other's throats. This poor man was in a lot of pain. He was dying of uh, advanced cancer. And he was, um, he was angry, and they were angry. And the whole thing, it was, it was an explosive situation. And I was just standing back because there wasn't anything I could say that would calm that family down. The man died. And as he died, he tried to enter my body. He did not want to die. He was not ready to die. And I could feel this, this icy, cold, kind of nauseating sense of his soul trying to take over my body. And I said to the family, I can't stay here. <laughs> and I went out into the hallway and I leaned against the wall and I said, you can't be in here. You've got to move on. Look around. There's there there are beings there that will, will help you. Look for the light. Look for a a relative, uh, an angel, some being, Jesus, someone who will help you get move on to where you should go. And then I felt him leave. Do you think it's possible that a being really could take over someone's body completely? Yes. If if. Uh, in a compromised situation, especially, in fact, I think it's, it's it's even possible if someone were out of their body um, on an adventure <laughs> or because of an accident or something like that, there have been some theories about other, other beings moving into that body, occupying that body, walk in, basically, is what it's called. I used to think that, and I still think it's possible, but... I started accepting the idea that our bodies are manifestations of our consciousness. So if our consciousness just leaves the body, I would think it would just die. But maybe someone, some other consciousness could plug in and just take it over if they completely leave. I don't know. You get a hint of that when people have heart transplants and they say suddenly they're interested in gardening or uh, skiing and never were before, but the but they do a little research and find out that the heart came from someone that was a gardener or a skier. And there are um, brain cells in the heart. I mean, there are other organs. I mean, it can happen in a tiny way in a, in a, in a transplant situation like that. Well, if you, you can imagine if, if one spirit leaves the body and another one moves in, there was um, one, uh, story I, I had told on our show about a woman who um, had some sort of massive illness, I think. Anyway, when she came out of it, she was they said she was just such a different person, and it wasn't because she'd seen anything. Um, it was because she was a different person. I mean, she uh, and her husband didn't like her anymore and she didn't like him she didn't want him in a, in her life it wasn't like uh, you know some people will have a near death experience and they'll say oh, it changed me and now i now i'm interested in god and they're married to an atheist and so the atheist says i can't stand this and they, they leave no this was different that was a totally different personality different interest even uh, different level of education everything so I think, yes, I think it's possible. I don't think it happens very often, but I do think it's possible. When you were in the hospital and somebody was afraid of dying, what kind of advice would you give them? Oh, I tell them a story. I tell them if they wanted, I no, you can't, I can't say that this was always the way to go because sometimes people are locked into their own religious beliefs. The, the basic thing, that you would like to see people in that situation do is make peace with their family. I've, I've seen dozens of heartbreaking reconciliations between say two brothers or a, a father and a son uh, in, on a deathbed, in a deathbed scenario where 
for 30 years, they fought with each other, wouldn't speak to each other. They swore, if they spoke, it was swearing at each other. And at the end, they, they recognize this is a person that I love, you know? And uh, so if there's a situation like that, I, <clears throat> I always tried to reconcile, see some reconciliation. Um, that usually involves forgiveness. And forgiveness is really important. That's... The, Forgiveness and love go hand in hand. If you can, if you can forgive, it's like the Lord's Prayer, you know, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It, your forgiveness on the other side, I think, does rely on your your forgiving. And uh, even if it's even if it's delayed, maybe it doesn't happen until you're on the other side. I think that's still a possibility because we're eternal beings anyway. But um, forgiveness and love are just so, so integrated with each other. So I try to, I, just as a chaplain, I would try to promote that. And then I would, uh, but, but in many, many cases, people who were afraid of dying took great comfort in hearing a near-death experience story. What kind of advice would you give to the families who are grieving over the loss of their loved ones? I love telling NDE stories to patients, especially dying patients, while the family's there, because they benefit equally. Um, it's uh, These stories are so powerful. I mean, we know how different they can be because they're, because they're personalized. But the basis of it is always light and love and forgiveness. And um, uh, the understanding, sudden understanding of empathy, uh, the life review where you're standing in the other person's shoes and experiencing the, the pain you caused them or the joy you provided to them at some point in your life. It makes... Uh, people aware that of the need for empathy, you know, even in memory, you know, to put yourself in in the shoes of someone that you've hurt, so that you can begin to forgive yourself, or or if that doesn't work just by itself, getting in touch with them and apologizing for whatever harm you did or pain you caused. All of that, um, all of these uh, elements of a near death experience story that you and I hear all the time has such resonance to someone that's not used to hearing them. I mean, if you've heard 500 stories or a thousand stories or probably more, after a while, you're, you're looking at elements of it and saying, well, I, let's see, does that comport with, or why did that person, what's a, what is it about that person that made them look behind themselves and, and see that they're, that the the scene that they were walking through is disappearing behind them. What is that? But that kind of analysis, when you're just, when you're on the point of death, you're hearing about the love part. You're hearing about the, the power of, uh, of um, a figure like a, a Jesus or an angel or, you know, the light of God. I mean, that's what you're clinging to. That's, that's your soul's response to it. And it's, uh, it's very healing very healing. And if doctors and nurses, uh, um, hospice nurses already know this because they're always, they're all always sitting with people who are dying. And if 50% of the time, if somebody is consciously conscious when they're dying, they see something, they'll, they'll say, they'll be looking at a blank wall and saying, isn't it beautiful? Oh, look at that garden. Or, oh, I see my brother coming to take me home. That, or, patient asked me uh do you see that angel it's just outside the window and i say well i i don't see the angel but i'm sure he's there if you see him i'm sure he's there that kind of um uh experience has won over the hearts <laughs> of most uh, uh hospice nurses doctors they 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 think it's all hallucination they're, they're beginning to change but Nurses more are more much more likely to stay behind. You know who we really had though uh, working on on the behalf of near death experience in my hospital were the cleaning people. 
they'd be in a room when somebody was was uh, had just come back from surgery or something like that and they'd had an experience they'd start talking to the cleaning person and they'd heard these stories and they believed it <laughs> it was you know the god works in mysterious ways you know these the, uh these these stories get communicated one way or another but when you and i are are talking to someone and, and a million people are listening that's a, we're having a powerful influence to the good i i do believe i agree now you have a book called beyond the phoenix door what <laughs> yes. is that about uh i wrote that when i was in seminary and i wrote it because there was a professor who was a, a total jerk <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote it not as a project. I was it was my project. It was my volunteer effort to convince him that that there was more to uh, oh. he taught uh, courses in Paul, uh, Saint Paul. He taught where Paul was when he wrote this letter, where he was when he wrote that letter, what ship he was on, what boat he was on, what. Uh, when he nearly drowned, um, it was all, it was like a travel log for this guy. And he never taught a thing about the theology. It, it's incredible. And we know that Paul had a near-death experience because it's described. Uh, he describes it himself, although he puts it in th third person. But uh, he wouldn't go into any of that. and And so I wrote this. It was going to be a novel about near-death experience. But uh, it turned out to be uh, more of, I call it adventure theology. It's about uh, a couple that leave the seminary to go find the Garden of Eden in, in, a, in a different dimension. I, I wouldn't call it, um, I wouldn't call it science fiction though, because it's just not that science fiction-y. It's just that that's how they managed to find it ultimately but it's uh there's a military thing going on there's a uh, a group of um people that are trying to rule the world and one of them is uh basically satan and uh when they're in the garden they're having this conversation about um duality which is a big topic for those people that are interested in in uh death and dying and uh why what and the nature of evil so and interestingly enough you know we were talking earlier about my my straw bale house in in the red rocks area uh i wrote this with my yellow pad and my and my pen i found a vortex i think because i sitting on Schnebly Hill in Sedona, I was having this conversation with Satan about, and I was just writing it down. It was, it was, you know, I didn't hear a voice or anything, but I, you know, I was, he was explaining why, you know, in a dualistic world, there had to be evil. And so I wrote this, that whole chapter is, is um, in the book is based on this experience I had on Schnebly Hill. But um, anyway, that's sort of beside the point. Anyway, uh, it's uh, it's about our destruction of the environment. It's about um, power politics, and it's and it has lots and lots of references to various mythologies um, in Middle Eastern mythologies. So I I used it as a because the, because they're. Um, the man and the woman involved in the search are uh, trying to understand what it is they're seeing and why things are the way they are. And so he'll bring up a myth, she'll bring up a myth. So it was a way of delivering a lot of uh, um, mythologies to go along with the, the adventure they were on. So that's why I dub it Adventure Theology. You post videos on your YouTube channel once a week? Once a week, yep. What days do they come out on? What uh, they come out, um, they're produced by a company called Talk Zone, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern on Monday. And uh, so if you go to 
if you just look up uh, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting Talk Zone. And then as soon as we can, um, we get them over to, uh, which is almost instant. I mean, you can also go to our YouTube library, and that's um, uh, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting YouTube, and look at the current show or any of the archived 533, I think, shows that we've got there now. Uh, a fellow named Ken Root uh, manages that. And there you can comment on the show. And also, as as long as we've been able to, or as long as we we are able to, we'll run them uh, ad-free because, like you and I discussed earlier, it's kind of disconcerting to have an ad jump in the middle of somebody's profound spiritual experience. Lee, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? It's all about love. We have to stop. Um, and I don't know what, what's going on right now that makes it so easy to d divide one group against another. But we see it in Israel. We see it in Russia and Ukraine. We see it in the politics of this country. We see it um, divisiveness. And actually, um, I think one of the pro big problems is the internet, which is also the source of your your conversation with me and mine with you and with all the other people who've had these experiences. It's uh, it's a wonderful medium, but it, it is bringing uh, the society to rack and ruin because it's so divisive. People get to quarreling in social media for no good reason. And, uh, and there's also a lot of um, intentional division that's planted by bots, by politics by uh religious voices against religious voices and so forth we got to look past all that we just have to see that everything is based we are built we are intrinsically built out of love consciousness of the world is god's consciousness it's not anything but god's consciousness he was the creator and he, he is imbued in the in the creation and and his nature is love and so our nature is love we just have to let go and and uh, let God start um, programming us better than we program ourselves. Uh, and if we did that, we could have our Eden back. We really could. We could be. Uh, we could have our our love back for one another. We could have uh, a reason to um, procreate and know that our children would be living in a better world than 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 we have been rather than a worse world so i guess that's that wasn't a simple answer but, to your question but that uh, brings in a lot of the elements that are haunting me on a regular basis lee thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest well thank you i think this has been this is always good when two people who are working on the same thing toward the same ends get to talk in public yeah as as we are right now it's great to meet a colleague you know i consider yeah. you you know one of my peers that since we do the same work exactly exactly so thank you for the work you're doing the good work you're doing likewise thanks for watching the jeff mara podcast I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.